Hey everybody, this is Tim Ash, President of the Vermont State Senate, and here with my daily update on Vermont's response to the COVID-19 pandemic, and very fortunate uh, to have with me today Bill McKibben to talk about how, what lessons we can derive from the pandemic, its effect on the state, the nation, the globe, and how that you know, can teach us more about the need to tackle another existential crisis facing our planet, which is climate change. And Bill, of course, is uh, Vermont's own and one of uh, the foremost thinkers about addressing climate change and the imperative to do something about it. So Bill, thank you so much for joining me. Tim, what a pleasure to be with you. And, and these are good questions and ones I've obviously been thinking about and writing about some in the last little while. Um, in fact, I, about a month ago, uh, 60 Minutes had a socially distanced crew up to interview me. <laughs> we did it outdoors uh, uh, near Robert Frost's old writing cabin there uh, in Ripton. And, and so I, I've been thinking a lot about the, the what lessons. There, there are no silver linings to a pandemic, um, too much misery. But if we're going to go through this kind of trauma, we might as well learn something from it. And I... I would say, here's, here are my candidates for three things worth having learned. One, to be reminded that reality, in fact, is real. Uh, we live in a world where we, you know, we're behind screens all the time. Everything seems editable and shapeable and mutable and so on. But, I, you know, I've spent 30 years trying to explain to people that physics and chemistry don't negotiate and don't compromise. The microbe has done the same thing for biology. You know, Donald Trump may stand up all he wants and fulminate about how it's a hoax or it's going to go away by Easter or whatever, but the microbe could care less. You know, if it says wear a mask, wear a mask. It's in charge, you know, not us. Corollary to that, second lesson, and this is one that <laughs> perhaps Vermont and its uh, legislators do well to always uh, bear in mind. Speed really matters. Like we learned a lot about flattening curves in the last few months. The US and South Korea got their first case of coronavirus on the same day in January. South Korea went right to work, shut down large gatherings, started testing everyone. They're not over it, but they're kind of looking at it in the rear view mirror. We wasted the next five or six weeks. Uh, February was a wasted month for the US. On, and as a result, not only did we have to disrupt our economy to a far greater degree when we finally got around to it, but even having done that, we suffered enormous trauma. Uh, you know, we've got a pile of 100,000 dead bodies in this country. Uh, so speed is crucial, and that's a perfect analog to the climate battle. I mean, look, February stands in for the last 30 years in climate time. Uh, the time that scientists had given us eloquent warnings, but our, our leaders took little to no action, always found it more convenient to put things off for a while or, you know, move slowly or moving slowly at this point doesn't help. Uh, moving slowly, going slowly on climate is just another way of losing. You know, winning slowly is another way of losing. So that was, that's a good thing to be reminded of. If we flatten the carbon curve, uh, at a rapid rate, we have a better chance. Third thing, and this goes very much to your work over the years, you know, social solidarity really, really matters. Uh, we grew up in the political shadow of Ronald Reagan and of the idea that markets were going to solve all problems and that our job was just to pursue our own individual self-interest, you know. You're, you're younger than I am, but, you know, Reagan's great uh, laugh line always in his speeches was the nine scariest words in the English language are I'm from the government and I'm here to help. You know, ha ha ha. Uh, it turns out the scariest words in the English language are, uh, you know, we've run out of ventilators. Um, and there's no way that you can solve that problem by yourself any more than, you know, if someone comes and says, well, the hillside behind your house is now caught on fire, you know. Um, these are things we can only solve when we work together. So hopefully this will be a good reminder that we need uh, you know, governments at work, people coming together to make things happen. Um, 
Um, and I think that those lessons are probably being reinforced these weeks by the, uh, uh, by the uprisings that we're seeing around this country. Um, well, it is, you know, it's, it's interesting, you, you know, that Reagan line, you know, right now, whether it's businesses, states, local governments, the scariest things they could hear is, I'm from the government and I'm not here to help. <laughs> and there's really, I mean, we are hearing it loudly and clearly, we can't do it on our own as individual businesses, individual yeah. households. We need the government now to be the entity that marshals collective action to support us. Absolutely. And obviously, in our system, we need the federal government at work uh, to some degree or another, because they're the ones who actually can print money, you know. And, and I mean, <laughs> it's, you know, uh, that's just the, the reality of where we are. And, and uh, so, so this is a time of great testing, but it's not going to be the last time of testing. In fact, I think it's pretty clear that this is, you know, we'll look back on this as one of the first big crises in a century of crises. Even if we do most things right about climate change from this point in, the effects are gonna be large. They may be containable, they may not bring down civilizations, they may. I mean, if we delay much longer, they almost certainly will. So, so get ready for lots of tests. And, for, and, and of course, Vermont is better situated than some places simply because it retains higher levels of social solidarity. Mm -hmm. I saw interesting data yesterday. Uh, in March, as the COVID crisis began, uh, they started tracking uh, what places in the country were reducing their driving the most as a kind of proxy for who was taking this most seriously and getting to work on it. And Vermont came in first. Vermont had done a better job of that than any place. And I think that's because we have, I mean, because to one degree or another, there are state motto, uh, freedom and unity is, it, it, you know, is we, we, we actually pay some attention to. And we've been very grateful to watch over the last few weeks in Montpelier, the governor and everybody else coming together and working rationally to deal with the crisis at hand. You know? And I, I was very proud of Vermont when, when they called the demonstration in Montpelier to you know, demand that they, and, and seven people showed up to do it. It was, okay, good, that's a, that's a good sign. You know? No, it's been, I, I've, I've watched uh, challenges over the years in my life in public service. And when we think about Tropical Storm Irene, um, everyone banded together in a way, but it wasn't a problem that threatened everybody equally. And so I think you're right, the, the sense of camaraderie and esprit de corps in Vermont uh, has helped us actually give meaning to the term public health, uh, which is that I take an action because it will benefit someone who I might never meet and might make them less likely to be infected or die. And, you know, the challenge, I guess, now is does the same spirit of coming together and showing unity apply to things that are slower moving mm -hmm. crises. Mm -hmm. uh, it's much easier to band together to help someone whose house has just burned down or to prevent people from getting sick and dying tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Banding together to say, how do we sustain a decades long project um, with diffuse responsibility all around the globe becomes another challenge altogether. Good news. So that's why the good news is that the climate project which again has to go quickly. I mean, if if we do it over the course of many decades, we won't have done it. We need to do it over the course of decade, is sort of what the scientists are telling us now. But that's why it's good news that at this point it's also an economic winner to take it on. And I mean, I mean, it's the poorest people in the state of Vermont are the ones who, as you drive around the city that stayed on a cold day, you can tell are heating the outdoors because, you know, you can see the, the waves of heat coming out the walls and windows, you know. Um, it should make complete sense for us to figure out as a state how to finance the retrofits and improvements to those places, 
knowing that it'll produce immediate savings on people's utility bills, uh, people who really need it, and that it will staunch the flow of money out to Saudi Arabia or the Koch brothers or whatever else. Uh, and instead, we can produce that energy that we need right within our borders. So, and in the process, put lots and lots and lots of people to work. As you know, renewable energy is already a big part of Vermont's uh, uh, employment picture. Yeah, and making buildings efficient is certainly labor intensive, which which is very no good. For them. Put their house on a boat, Tim, and send it to China to get it insulated. You know, it has to happen here. And so it should happen here. And the thing we need Montpelier to do is figure out how to make the kind of financial arrangements that allow, we don't need it to, I mean, it, as I say, a lot of this work pays for itself. It just doesn't pay for itself up front, you know? Uh, so, so that's where we need people's, and we have some resources to, you know, uh, uh, the Vermont Energy Efficiency Investment Corporation and, uh, you know, all that are, are real assets to have. Absolutely. My, my hope, I mean, in, is, you know, as someone who's been in the sort of trenches writing a lot of the legislation over the years, um, my hope is that what we're going through now helps, you know, it's almost like a snow globe. You shake it up and all the little pieces land in slightly different spots afterwards. And, you know, I've been talking about doing a, an efficiency bond mm -hmm. um, for residential and building heating efficiency. Mm -hmm. And the, the challenge we've had up till this moment is that the state's fiscal leaders, and by that I mean the treasurer, those who work in whichever governor's administration, have taken a very cautious and conservative view about debt mm -hmm. uh, because they're afraid it'll hurt the state's credit rating, which of course we have to be concerned about. But when we look at some jurisdictions, they've gone big into efficiency in ways that have produced more revenue mm -hmm. to the public uh, treasury than it has cost to pay the interest on the debt. And, but it requires thinking differently about the long-term benefits and being willing to take that risk in the short term to start producing these long-term benefits. So I'm hoping that we can shake that up as a result of what we're going through right now. That's true. And I hope, I, I hope that a number of things get shaken up. I got to say, uh, just watching, uh, you know, I, mean, I, I spend, I don't spend that much time I got to say, working on stuff in Vermont, just because um, there's other people who are doing a great job. Shout out to my colleagues at 350 VT and things. Uh, but also because probably it's, you know, I've got to focus on China and India and Texas and, you know. Right. But one of the, the thing that always galls me is that the state of Vermont maintains its investments through its pension funds and through the UVM uh, endowment in precisely the industry that's killing us off. Uh, why we haven't divested from fossil fuel long ago and why legislators didn't demand that the state treasurer do that remains a complete mystery to me. Uh, these are investments that have lost us huge sums of money over time. Um, because the fossil fuel industry has been the worst performing part of our economy long before the COVID crisis sunk it yet again. And this was an easy and powerful way for the state to stand up and make an important, you know, this divestment campaign has become one of the key parts of the fight for a sensible energy future. So uh, this is the one thing that you all could do simply by taking a vote and it wouldn't cost a damn thing. It would save money, and it would, and it would reassure some of us that that actually there was, uh, you know, the wheels were turning up there when it came. That's, to you know, it's 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 been a um, governance challenge, and that's obviously um, when you put a governance challenge up against the fate of the planet. Sometimes you have to pick a winner, right. um, and well, you as you know, are, you are, the governance is your business. Yeah, so you this can go govern your way to extinction, <laughs> but um, but have you know proper procedures. Um, you know, those of us who have been pressuring the treasurer to divest, um, you know, there's always some technical reason why it's 
hard to disaggregate. And the irony is back in the late fall, early winter, when uh, Senator Andy Perchlick, me and a couple other people met with the treasurer, made the case that uh, other investments would perform better. And you look at the fact that they were practically giving oil away, um, the timing is yeah. not just from the, I mean, obviously from the planet's point of view, but from a financial point of view, the justification for maintaining the status quo has just disappeared. And uh, so we've got progress there to make. <laughs> Let me ask you, you you're, because you're, you know, of any Vermonter, you are uh, likely to be more tied into what's going on uh, around the country and around the world in terms of, uh, act, you know, real action around climate change. Sure. Have you seen anything that's stemming from the pandemic that's igniting new, uh, new mo momentum, new passion, yeah, new? Absolutely. Uh, country after country around the world is taking a kind of Green New Deal template as their recovery idea. It looks like that's going to dominate the EU's recovery from their economic woes. Uh, France and Germany and others seem very invested in it. Uh, uh, it's a little harder to tell exactly what's going on in China right now. Um, China's political system is opaque enough to make it difficult to, but, but it appears that there continues to be a kind of uh, uh, emphasis on renewable energy. I mean, they've been installing it faster than anyone in the world, even as there's also some backsliding around coal and things right now as they try to gin up the economy. Um, in general, this is clearly the moment to be doing this work. Um, in, you know, we've got 40 million unemployed people in this country now. If you cast about for what task there is large enough to absorb even a portion of that labor, you quickly come upon the idea that the thing that we most need to do as a society is make this quick energy transition. Uh, and as we said, the economics support it, you know. Um, you, you have to come up with the money to get people to do it, but when you do, it pays back the whole system, even if you're not counting the money you about a bit with your with your ripped in coverage until your your point about the need for broadband improvements in ripped in is being proven at the moment bill Let's see if we can reestablish your presence in real time here. Yeah. I can hear you. Let me hit pause for a sec. All right, we've got you back live and in person here. Let me just say, you know, it's no accident that the last time we were in a Great Depression in this country, we came out of it with a new deal. This time, the Green New Deal is clearly where we need to go. Clearly, we won't get there until we change proprietorship in D.C., but that doesn't mean that those of us in states and cities and towns can't work on a lot of the things that need doing in the meantime, um, because it makes both economic and environmental sense. Uh, uh, this is good work that we need people to do and that we can train people to do fairly easily. And, and, and provides not only good work, but work that is desperately important to the common wheel, you know, to, to our common fate going forward. And that's what humans need in all times, you know. So we're grateful to everybody trying to figure out how to get us through this moment in Montpelier. And we're grateful to those of you who are trying to figure out how to get us through this century too because uh, those things are, are deeply linked. But thank you very much, Tim. Well, let me uh, maybe end on one note, which is that, um, you know, people don't associate Joe Biden with being a visionary environmentalist over the years. It's not been an issue at his sort of the forefront of his policy advocacy. Um, and I know that there is a re real gap in enthusiasm for his candidacy. It's not to say people won't cast votes, but um, 
the passion isn't quite there the way it would be for someone like a Bernie or another candidate who really excites people. Um, but it really does highlight the consequences. If he's not elected, everything we've just talked about is made so, 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 so much harder. And, um, and this is why we build movements because yeah. there's no, you can't, I mean, the point is not politics is not to rely on individual people to get things done. The point is to build movements that shift zeitgeists, that make it possible for good leaders to get things done and make it impossible for bad leaders to perform their particular brand of evil. So that's why we build movements. And that's why it's really good that there are so many people in Vermont who are working hard on these things. Well, hopefully we'll be able to make good progress despite the challenges we're facing, which are, there's no shortage of just brutal um, financial challenges right now, but we're committed to making progress. So. All right. Uh, thanks for, thanks for being a guiding light, Bill. It's uh, it's, we're blessed to have you in the state. Uh, and get us invested, if nothing else. That one doesn't cost a penny, so get on it. <laughs> I've got many lessons from you today, including that reality is reality, which I'm going to take away. I'm going to, I'll, I'll give you credit for it, but I'm going to steal it. All right. Well, that's good. Take care, man. All right. Thanks, Bill. And thanks, everybody, for watching.